So Isaiah 25, 8, the prophecy, he will swallow up death and victory. He's referring to the Messiah. The Messiah will swallow up death and victory. And the Lord will wipe away tears from all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from all of the earth, for the Lord has spoken it. He will swallow up death and victory. Okay, this is, you got to hear me out. This is, we're going on another rabbit hole. What I'm saying, are there two gods in the Old Testament? And what I'm suggesting is, is there a God of life and a God of death? It is, it, it's, it's a controversial topic. I said, what is life? And I'll say, Abba, the Heavenly Father. And I refer to the commandment, thou shalt not kill. Now, this is controversial. Thou shalt not kill is controversial. But I'm like, that's life. Like, preserve life. And other people like to say, it's just murder. It's, it's just, it only refers to, to, to people. And, it li like, yeah, life is life. I want to show y'all something. Maybe, I mean, I don't know. Anyways. I've been going through this thing where this is, this is heavy. This is really heavy. And I, I was sharing with the crowd earlier that I've been reading the King James Version. I've also been reading this book called The Gospel of the Holy Twelve, The Essene Gospel of Peace, yeah. so and, then, and then The Essene, and then The Second Coming of Christ by Yogananda. Anyways, my genuine understanding as Christians is that we're supposed to be eating vegetarian. I'm not even sure if I get into it in this section. We'll see what happens. For thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord, his name is Jealous. He is a jealous god. Then another says, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. And it's like, so that to me is not life. War, war is death. The, the seven deadly sins, one of the seven ones is envy, jealousy. Which is not God. Yeah, and, but it's going back here. For thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. And I'm suggesting, I'm like, is that the Heavenly Father? That is, not. is the Heavenly Father jealous? That's a very inconsistent Yeah, that's what I'm just... And, and so, and then here's another one. Now therefore kill every male among the little ones, and kill every woman that hath known, by, known man by lying with him. But all the women, but all the women children that have not known a man, the virgins, by lying with him, keep alive for yourself. It's called the spoils of war. This is saying like after a war, take all the virgins. I, this God is saying, I want all the virgins. And then he's saying, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And it's like, but it's like, I thought there was just one God. I was like, where are these, these other gods? So I'm going to compare two scriptures right here. So for a scripture from Leviticus. For the life of the flesh is, of, is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make an atonement for you, uh, for, for, for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. Um, and, then, and then it has down here, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Yeah, so anyways, this one is, is talking about like making sacrifices on an altar, and then the other one is saying that, that can't take away sins. It's like, don't, don't do that. You can't. I've been reading these things. I really resonate with them. And they, they suggest veganism and, and, and raw vegan. It's just essentially not killing. And the parentage and conception of John the Baptist. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in, in, in the sight of the Lord, and shall neither eat flesh meats nor drink strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Spirit, and even from his mother's womb. This is from chapter one of the Gospel of the Holy uh, of the Gospel of the Holy Twelve. But you see, it says, uh, "And shall neither eat flesh meats," which is in contradiction to what uh, to. Well, actually, we'll get into it. But John the Baptist ate locusts. Y'all heard that, right? John the Baptist ate honey and locusts. And, and, and the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leather girdle about his loins. And his meat was locusts and wild honey. So everyone's saying John ate bugs. And God blessed... So this is Genesis. So we're going back to the Bible over here. Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion. Because a lot of people say this is how they justify eating meat. They're like, God gave us dominion. God gave us dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon earth. Then you look at 29. 
And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. We're supposed to be the caretakers of this earth, and our meat is right there the herb bearing seed, the fruit bearing tree, the locust fruit tree. There's a fruit tree called the locust fruit tree. This is what John the Baptist ate. He ate fruit. He ate fruit and honey. Yeah. The return of the two and seventy. Blessed are ye of the inner circle who hear my word and to whom mysteries are revealed, who give to no innocent creature the pain of prison or of death, but seek the God of all, for such is everlasting life. Blessed are ye who abstain from all things gotten by bloodshed and death, and fulfill all righteousness. Blessed are ye that ye shall attain to beatitude. This is again Gospel of the Holy Twelve, chapter twenty. Again talking about don't do not eat the animals. Now we get into the multiplication of the fish and the bread to the five thousand. One of the most famous miracles of Jesus. But we're going to read it from the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, chapter twenty-nine. The feeding of the five thousand with six loaves and seven clusters of grapes. This is saying grapes, not fish. And he saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? Go and see. And when they knew, they said, Six loaves and seven clusters of grapes. And he commanded them to make, to make all sit down by companies of fifty upon the grass. And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. And when he had taken the six loaves and the seven clusters of grapes, he looked up, up to heaven and blessed and brake the loaves and the grapes also, and gave to, to them his disciples and set before them, and they divided them of, among them all. And they all and they did eat and they did all eat and were filled and they took up twelve baskets full of fragments that were left and and they that did eat of the loaves and the fruit were about five thousand men women children and he taught them many things say it unto me follow me and I will make you fishers of men well here's Jesus the fish the, the, all the fish symbolism right. and what I'm saying astrotheology Pisces so y'all remember the great conjunction on December twenty first twenty twenty of of Jupiter and Saturn. A lot of people said this was the beginning of the age of Aquarius. I want to play y'all a clip. you want to know? You want to know what this is all about? Is that it, Gelfly? You don't know? You've never looked at the heavens. Everything in the heavens is here, moving as the heavens move. This is how to know when. That's what. Suns, moons, stars, yes, the angle of eternity. That's how I know it's coming. How else can I make the prediction? A thousand years ago, there was a great conjunction. I was there. Three suns lined up. That's when the crystal cracked. That's when the Skeksis appeared. And the mystics. Another great conjunction coming up. Anything could happen. The whole world might burn up. End of Ogre. <laughs> Better have your shard before that, Gelfling. Now, ask what the Great Conjunction is. What's the Great Conjunction? What's the Great Conjunction? You tell me. The Great Conjunction is the end of the world. Or oh, the beginning? Huh. End, begin, all the same. Big change. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. So there we have a movie where she's like, it's the end of the world or the beginning of it. And so what I'm saying, what I'm saying, what I'm suggesting here is the Great Conjunction was a lot of people saying it was the end of Pisces, the beginning of Aquarius. Uh, the end of Piscean age, which I'm saying Jesus possibly was like, like the Messiah, the Messiah came during the age of Pisces. And now 
what I'm suggesting is now we're going into the age of Aquarius where we may see the second coming of Christ, this Christ that's in all of us, because Jesus is already here. We know he's not coming back, but I mean, maybe. It says he's coming back on a white horse. And, but what I'm saying is, like, I've rebuked demons in the name of Jesus. I'm like, he's here. Like, I, I know he's here with me. And, and this is very interesting. So we have two fish. We have a Pisces over here going towards Aries. And then we have another Pisces fish going towards Aquarius. We have the path of death. What I'm suggesting, the path of death is going towards Aries, which honestly is most of society. And then we have the path of life. Very few of us. Very few of us on the path of life. And now look at this. Look at this little fish right here. Pisces Austrinus is at the feet of Aquarius. So you have one fish going over towards Aquarius, and I'm suggesting it's going to mix in the waters of this third fish. There's the third fish. And I'm saying it's going to be the mixture of this feminine and masculine within us. Now, we're getting the separation of the sheep and the goats. It's, it, it, or I'm not, I'm not going to read that. I'm just going to tell you all the story. So you, Jesus is pretty much the good shepherd. And, and, and those who come under the protection of King Jesus Christ, he, you become one of his sheep. And now in our society, it's like, you don't want to be a sheep. Right. In this story, you want, you want to be one of the sheep. And everyone that's not in the, a part of the sheep and going into the barn house, the stable, the protection of the Heavenly Father and the Holy Spirit, they're a goat. And I don't think it's any coincidence that the goat is also the symbol of Baphomet as well. It's, and it's interesting. Jesus is like, you're either a sheep or you're a goat. We have another parable from Jesus, uh, the separation of the wheat and the tares. So uh, there's the, the, the farmer, the master who owns the land, and he's, he's growing wheat. And then one day the servants come and they're like, master, there are tares growing along with the wheat. And he's like, ah, oh, that our enemy neighbor, he came and he sowed tares in the middle of the night to try to ruin our harvest. Don't worry, don't try to, and the, and the servant's like, what do we do? And the master's like, wait until the harvest. Wait until the end times harvest. And you're going to harvest everything and you are going to separate the wheat from the tares. And in the parable, what it gets into, he says, take all the wheat, put them into bundles and put them in the storehouse. Take all the tares, which are the unwanted ones, and burn them. That's what he says. And again, this is symbolic. The sheep, the wheat, are on the path of life. The goats, the tares, are on the path of death. Broad and wide is the way of destruction. Many people are found on that broad and wide path. Very few of us are on the straight and narrow. Another parable, the midnight hour oil lamp, the ten virgins. Have you, have you all heard this parable? Another end times parable where there's a wedding feast and, and the, the bridesmaids are supposed to have their oil lamps ready for the wedding feast. Five of the virgins are smart and they prepare and they get extra oil to keep their lamp going because they don't know when the bridegroom is coming back. Five of the other virgins aren't so wise. They don't get extra oil. And essentially, they fall asleep and at midnight, the bridegroom comes and it's like, time for the wedding. Five of them, their oils are still going. Their lamp is still going. And the other five are like, oh, crap, our lamps went out. Like, give us some of your oil. And the other five are like, nah, like, it's, it's time. Like, and they're like, go to town and get your own oil. And so the five go to town, they get their oil, they come back, and the door to the wedding feast has been shut on them. It's been closed. This is symbolic about the inner fire within us and that every day, day in, day out, we need to be cultivating this inner fire, this inner love, this inner passion for the path of, for life, for God, for the truth. And, and essentially, this is the midnight hour oil lamp. And like, we have to have that. Jesus is pointing at his heart, the fire. It's like, we have to cultivate that fire in here because we don't know when the bridegroom's coming. And when the bridegroom comes, you better have your oil lamp going. Most people do not have the fire within going. I prefer calling him the great shepherd. I'm like, dude, he's, man, he's yeah, great. He's the, so good. Like, that actually makes you smile inside. Yeah, he's the great. He's the he best. The For y'all, I don't know if everyone's got to relate. Dude, this guy's the best. I used to be a hardcore atheist. I know that's hard to believe. Yeah, wow. I was hardcore. I would get angry if I heard the name Jesus. 
Okay, John 10.10. 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I, Jesus says, I am come that, that they may have life, and they may have it life, that they may have it more abundantly. Yeah. I am the great shepherd. The great shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. There's another parable where Jesus leaves the 99 behind. So essentially, Jesus, uh, the, the great shepherd, he's got 100 sheep. He loses one of them. He leaves the 99 behind to go off and find the one lost sheep because he's the great shepherd. And he's risking losing the 99 behind, but he's like, no, I got to go find that one. I got to go find that one that's lost. The black sheep. The black, the black swan. Or maybe I say the white tiger. The white tiger. <laughs> Life over death. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? Like, will you rebuild it in three days? But he didn't, Jesus didn't speak of a physical temple. He spake of his body. I know that the, the, the temple of God is your body and that the spirit of God dwelleth within you. And then another one says, the temple of God is not built by hands. So what is a temple? A temple is a place of worship, just like a synagogue, a mosque, a church. It's a place of worship. You go to and worship. What are these called on the side of our heads? They're called temples. So these scriptures, they may be later in the slides, but I'm just going to say it now. Rather than temple, I'm going to say church. Because the church isn't down the road. This is the church. So rather than temple, I'm going to replace the word temple with church. Don't you know that the church of God is your body and the spirit of God dwelleth within you? Don't you know that the church of God is not built by hands? The, all these churches were built by hands. Hand, like nail and hammer. This was not built by hands. This is the temple. This is the church. This is the mosque. This is the synagogue. Uh, life over death. It is custom in India when great souls prepare to leave this earth to celebrate with a banquet their release in spirit. Jesus, too, just before his passing, observed this oriental custom when he sent Peter and John to prepare for him and the twelve disciples not only the, the traditional Passover, but also a Last Supper. It touches the heart's deepest feelings to know that even though Jesus was divine, he was human too. He felt the pangs of approaching bodily separation from his beloved disciples and thus had the poignant desire to eat a farewell meal with them before his great ordeal. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take it, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for the many for the, re, for the remission of sins. Okay, now this is my like, an alternative perspective, because I grew up going to Catholic school, and I was going through the motions and everything, and then I became a devout atheist at the end of Catholic high school. And then I was like, dude, is this like cannibalism? I'm like, they're eating the body of Christ, and they're drinking his blood. I'm like... And Catholicism, it seems kind of satanic a little bit. I don't know. And then, and then this is what Yogananda, I refer to Yogananda a lot. But then Yogananda said something that made me think a little bit differently. Jesus showed again and again that his body was not himself. He was spirit. He could, he could pass through walls and walk on water because he knew the real substance of his form to be consciousness. So flesh of Christ means his consciousness. Blood means the life of Christ. The Holy Ghost, cosmic energy, that is, that is the life and the light of his little body called Jesus and his cosmic body of the universe. Anyone of any religion or any era who sees the sacred vibratory light of God and his reflected Christ consciousness finds that immediately that light changes the brain cells. This is the real import of partaking of the blood of Christ. By bathing in that light, which was and is his manifest life and power, deep Deeply meditating devotees are cleansed in the blood of divine energy that cauterizes their ignorance, bad habits, and see ten tendencies of past karma. Essentially what he's saying, he's saying the blood is the cosmic energy, the cosmic vibration, the amen, the om, or the Holy Spirit. He's saying the blood, or the bread, is the Christ consciousness. Okay, so esoteric and occult teachings of the Gospels. 
That's that that book right there. Nice. Esoteric, occult. <laughs> esoteric occult. People are really scared by those words. People are really scared by esoteric or occult. And yeah, uh, as me, I, I I cannot do this. Okay, so why did Jesus teach in parables? The way I like to kind of put it at it, it's like, it's, like, it's, it's like an onion. It's like layers and layers and layers and layers. And then I go into the etymology of the word occult. It essentially means hidden. That's what it means. It just means hidden. It's just, it's just not in plain view. Uh, it's saying, this is exo, exoteric versus esoteric. Exoteric is on the outside. It says intended for or likely to be understood by the generic pu general public, current or popular among the general public. Um, it comes from the Greek word exoterikos, which means external, outside of. Esoteric means intended for or likely to be understood by only a small number of people. Look at us. There's five of us here. Um, hidden, mysterious, beyond the range of ordinary knowledge, experience, or perception. Within, inside. Yeah, come on in. Jump on in. We're talking about the life over death right now. What is your name? Misha. Misha. Yeah. Everyone, this is Misha. All right. Uh, no, I think it's free game. Go for it. All right. So we're gonna we're gonna see where this goes. All right. John six thirty five. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life, and he that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. John six fifty three. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Life over death. This is from the Revelation. It, it, it talks about when Jesus died on the cross. It says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. So Jesus came back. He resurrected. He came back with the keys of hell and death. And then I want to add in these other ones right down here. Uh, write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks with which thou sawest are the seven churches. Um, I was, I was kind of hinting at earlier uh, this connection between seven chakras and a lot of the reference of seven in the book of Revelation. And, and, and back to the Jewish, the menorah for Hanukkah, seven candles. The Pleiades, the Pleiades are the seven stars. Oh, that's very interesting yeah, as well. Like but so I just put that in there. That was a little, that was a little, I just thought it was like a kind of interesting but the most important part right here is the keys of hell and of death the authority of King Jesus Christ everyone know about the everyone know about your authority in King Jesus Christ does everyone know about this do you know you know about your authority in King Jesus Christ am I the only one here that knows about oh dude y'all need to know this this is one of the most important things ever you see a picture of your Jesus rebuking demons. Right. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak new tongues. They shall take up serpents and they, they drink any deadly thing and it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And he ordained twelve that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. We can cast out devils in the name of Jesus Christ. We can heal in the name of Jesus Christ. As long as we have faith. Yeah, yeah. So this is our authority in King Jesus Christ, is that we can rebuke devils. I can't rebuke devils on my own, but I can in the name of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus lived, as far as I know, he lived a perfect life. And his murder on the cross was totally unjust. He goes down to the pits of hell and was like, dude, that was messed up, Satan. Give me the keys. Yeah. Give me the keys of hell and death. Now I have dominion. I have dominion over hell, over death, over you, over every demonic entity. Call on his name. It says, we did not give it, God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. If you ever feel, if you ever experience fear or anxiety, that is a demonic attack. Rebuke it in the mighty name of King Jesus Christ. You're coming under demonic attack when you feel fear and anxiety. That's not you. That's something outside of you. Trying to mess with your head. Rebuke it. 
And then another thing I do, I don't think I have it in the presentation, but a thing I learned is spiritual court. If you feel like you got attacked by a demonic entity or there's a black magician or a, a witch or something, that they, they did something to you, take it to spiritual court. I've done this before. And I'm like, Heavenly Father. And I, I recognize the Divine Mother. So I'm like, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Mother. If this person or this demon, if they did this to me, and, they're, and, and they really did, and they're found guilty, because they trespass against me. They hurt me. And I ask as uh, reparations that they are sent to the bottomless pit forever. And that I have divine protection from the seraphim angels of heaven. If that, and I, I'm just I'm like, it's a proposal. And, and I'm like, if they're guilty, I, I, this is what I want as reparations. Or if it's like a witch or a warlock, I'd be like, I ask that all their, all their psychic abilities are taken away from them. I want to say one thing as well, um, this idea of like demons, like where do they come from? The Christian perspective, where do they come from? Well, this goes back to Noah's Ark. Uh, well, it actually goes back to Genesis, it goes back to Genesis 6 where we have these things, these angels called the watchers. They're, they're looking out and they see, they see man and woman having sex and they became very curious. And so it says that the, uh, a third of the angels rebelled in heaven and then they were cast out and they came down to earth and then they began to have sex with the women of earth. And and that the children of these fallen angels with the women, they became known as the Nephilim, which are also known as the giants. And the Greeks, I think it was the Greeks, they talked about titans, like titans. And, and there's the story of uh, David Ruth Goliath, this giant. Anyways, if you go down the rabbit hole of this, you see like there's examples of giant skeletons. Then like throughout the world, there's also like buildings, really old buildings with giant doors that are like 20, 30 feet tall. And people are like, oh, they just look cool. And it's like, or they were doors for giants. Anyways, also, the idea. There was more oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere at the time. Mm. Were bigger. Like giant like, trees. Like, yeah, they're. Like what? Well, di di dino. And people were living. Things and people were living much longer. Yeah. Right, but, that yeah, there's this idea that there used to be giant. There used to be. It's a big rabbit hole. I don't cover it in this presentation, but there's evidence that there were giant trees, kind of like the movie Avatar. There's giant trees. Yeah. But the idea is, is that these giants, they were the ones that first started eating the animals. That's where man learned how to eat the animals. And then, then the giants started eating the humans. And then God's like, dude, I got to wipe these guys out. And that's where the flood comes. People, when, because Matthew 24 talks about the end times. And he, Jesus says, it will be like the times of Noah. And you look at the times of Noah, the Nephilim were there, the giants were there. And that was the reason why God flooded everything. He says, I gotta take these giants out. They're messing everything up. The spirits, the spirits of the giants, those are known as demons. Today, we call them aliens. Wow. That's, that's, what they, that's, that's what they are known today as. And let me, let me spell it out for you. There are A, Y. That's what an alien is. An alien is alive. What does the word terrestrial? What does the word terrestrial mean? It means Earth. So what does extraterrestrial mean? Extra Earth. If they were coming from up there, they would be called celestial. Celestials up there. Terrestrials down there. Extra Earth. And I'm just saying. A lie. Just, just something to meditate on. Um, but so I'm very, I'm very skeptical. It says, it says again, Paul. And Satan comes to us as an angel of light. A lot of these people are connecting to star beings and these like things. And I'm like, it says, it says, it comes to us as an angel of light, fallen angel, angel of light. I'm just, I'm a little cautious. And there's this beautiful picture here, and it says, life upon earth is warfare. In the top left, you have wrath. Anger versus patience. It's an, it, it, it's an angel and a demon fighting. Uh, on the top right, you have chastity versus lust. So like celibacy versus lust. On the left, you have sloth, laziness, versus diligence and productivity. On the right, you have kindness versus jealousy. Bottom left, you have gluttony, overindulgence in food, versus temperance. Temperance means self-control. On the bottom right, you have humility 
versus pride. And in the middle, you have, char you have charity versus greed. And these are the chakras. So the root chakra, the bad aspect, it also connects to the seven deadly sins. So the root, you have laziness. On the, on the positive, you have productivity. Uh, right here, lustfulness or purity. Right here, gluttony or self-control, temperance. Here, we'd have wrath or anger or patience and forgiveness. Here, we, let's just say greed and scarcity and hoarding. And over here, we have uh, generosity, sharing, charity, abundance. Up here, envy, jealousy, the opposite being love, kindness, compassion. Up here, the crown, pride, the Luciferian spirit, um, the, the ego, the spiritual ego. The opposite being meekness, humbleness, willing to be a servant of the Most High. The battlefield is our body. And in this image, we have the five horses that are symbolic of the five senses. We have touch, taste, smell, hearing, seeing. The chariot is our body. And then us, the, the individual devotee, we're in the back seat kind of tripping out. And then we need Christ to take the reins. That's Christ. That's Krishna. We need supernatural aid to take hold of the senses, to take hold of the reins, to, to help us win this battle. We need the help of, of God, divine intervention, to help us win this battle for our body, for our senses, for our mind, and our soul. What I've been doing is I've been doing regular purification rituals where I've been doing regular water baptisms, where I feel like if I kind of gone astray, I, I do regular repentance. And I, I regularly rebuke. I rebuke the demon of laziness. Because I, I, I've been slothful in my past, and I realize that's actually a demonic entity that was the, causing me to be lazy. Um, lustfulness, pornography addiction, sex addiction, sexual promiscuity, uh, sex outside marriage, which has all become normal. This is crazy what I'm saying right now, but it's become normal place. Because of Hollywood and our culture, this is totally the norm now. All this is just normal. Uh, gluttony, food addiction. Um, and it, I, I rebuke all of these, all seven of these I rebuke. And it gets into this photo right here. My buddy made this. He said, ignore the word wrath. He even later says, like, it's not appropriate to put the word wrath there because I don't consider the all loving Heavenly Father as an angry, angry God. Thank you. Oh, it says, keeping the commandments equals protected by God. And we have this energetic bubble around us. And, and what I get into later, I'm not sure if I have it in the slides or not, but I think I do. In Buddhism, we have the Yama, or the, the Eightfold Noble Path. In, in, the, in the yogic system, we have the Yamas and Niyamas. In the Ten Commandments of Exodus, we have, the, we have the Ten Commandments of Moses. The Essenes, they have their own Ten Commandments. The, the, I'm pretty sure I do put it in here, but the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, they have their own Ten Commandments, but essentially their purification guidelines, and they're all similar. All those systems I just said, they're all very similar and cover the main topics. And what I'm saying is that when we are living in accordance to these purification guidelines, we are energetically protected. And when we start indulging in the seven deadly sins, and we start eating the animals, and we start just doing all this other stuff, we lose our shield. And now we're open to attack. Life over death. And these signs shall that follow them that believe. Okay, we talked about this. You should be able to, to heal. You should be able to heal the sick, raise the dead, walk. Like he's, Jesus said, the works that I do, you'll be able to do greater because I go unto the Father. Here's again prophecy of Isaiah. He shall swallow up death in victory. He was literally victorious in death. The Satanist crucified him on the cross. He goes down to hell, takes the keys from Satan, their god of this world, the god of death, and he, and, and he comes back. Resurrection. I think I got a picture. I'm going to save it. Yeah. But, but love. We go, we go into love. He's, he comes back. The first person he talks to is Mary Magdalene. He says, Jesus saith unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in my name, in me, shall never die. Shall never die. Believest thou, believest thou this? Cannot kill him. It's kind of Jesus being a gangster. I'm like, it's the most gangster thing. Dude, they literally killed him. They literally killed him. And he, bring, he literally builds his body back. And he's like, I'm back. 
<laughs> I'm like, that's honestly as gangster as it gets. Follow in his footsteps. Now this is where it gets crazy. This is where it gets crazy what I'm saying. I'm taking it to another extreme when it says, take up my, he says, deny yourself, pick up my cross and follow me. And so when I see follow in his footsteps, he says, the works that I do, you'll be able to do the same works and greater because I'm going to the Father. You're going to be here. Healing the blind, healing the lepers, healing the paralyzed, healing the bleeding woman. The one that like touched his clothes and she was healed. Multiplication of the food, the feeding of the grapes and the bread, the calming the storm, walking on water, turning water into wine, raising the dead, the resurrection, the resurrection. John 21, 25. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written, everyone, I suppose that even the world, the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Jesus did so many miracles, they're saying the world could not even contain, contain it. That's what it's saying right there. Follow in his footsteps. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, and else believe me for the, for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Then look at Peter. This is what Peter's doing. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fear? So Peter, he's like, he's calm in the storm. And Peter sees Jesus out in the water. And Peter runs out after him. And then he begins to lose faith. Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea. And like Jesus like pulls him out of the water. But he took a leap of faith there. He was walking on water. And then fear came in. The enemy came in. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way. I, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Because we covered the way. We were saying the way. Where is the way? We're saying the way is up the spine. It's the teachings. It's everything. The way is so many. It's an onion. It's a layer to an onion. And it, it, it's the Tao. There's so many ways to the way. The truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And the life. We just covered the life. Now we're coming to the section, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Because most Christians say it is very clear right here. You cannot get to the Heavenly Father unless you go through Jesus Christ. It's very simple. It's right there. Or is it? No man cometh unto the Father by, by me. What I'm saying is, no man cometh unto the cosmic consciousness of the Father but by the Christ consciousness of Jesus Christ. And then back to the Trinity. Y'all weren't here when we covered the Trinity, but I was, I was suggesting that the Holy Spirit is the mother and that the father and the mother made the son. The male and the female made the son. I'm saying the heavenly father is the cosmic consciousness. The mother is the cosmic vibration, the Om or the Amen. And then the son is the Christ, the Christ consciousness. What I'm saying is that the current human consciousness that we are in right now, if we were to immediately go to the cosmic consciousness of the Father, we would burst like this light bulb right here. Our current consciousness is this light bulb that's like barely anything. The cosmic consciousness of the Father is like boom, just like that. Christ, I view as the dimmer. You cannot get to the cosmic consciousness of the Father, but by going through the Christ. Now we're going to get into something interesting. And when he was 12 years old, Jesus is in the temple and he's teaching. And Mary and Joseph, they couldn't find him for three days and they come back. And he's like, they were like, where were you, Jesus? 12-year-old Jesus. They're like, where were you? And he's like, I was in my father's house doing his business. He was teaching. The key, the key here is that a 12-year-old little boy was teaching all these rabbis and all these like old men. It's like, that's pretty remarkable. Then he's 30 years old. Then he's 30 years old, and he's being baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. 12 years old. Next thing we know, 30 years old, being baptized, because there it says, to be about 30 years of age, right there at the bottom. What was the most famous man of all time doing between the ages of 12 years young and 30 years old? The Bible says absolutely nothing, and no one questions this. I'm like, this is the elephant in the room. 
He lived for 33 years, and we're missing 18 years of his life, and no one questions that? I'm the only one, like, what's up? He's the most famous person. That's a valid question. 12 to 30, those are huge years. Those are huge years. And I'm suggesting he was traveling the world. There's evidence that he was in Great Britain. There's evidence that he was in India. Now, this is, a, this is a screenshot from the Second Coming of Christ, this big book right here. The ancient manuscripts say Jesus spent six years in various holy cities, settling for some time in Jagannath, a sacred pilgrimage site of Piercy, Orissa. The famous temple there, which has existed in one form or another since ancient times, is dedicated to Jagannath, Lord of the Universe, a title associated with the universal consciousness of Bhagavan Krishna. The name by which Jesus identify, is identified in the Tibetan manuscripts, so they, they have these Tibetan manuscripts in this temple, they refer to him as Isha, which means Lord. Isha is an extension of the, of the name Ishvara. Ishvara is the name for God in Hinduism. And Isha is a nickname. It's essentially, there's a, is, is, Isha derives from Ishvara. And um, Ishvara is the supreme, like, supreme God, Heavenly Father, the Creator. This is the true character of Christ Krishna. Because we talked about earlier how, because you missed this part, but we talked about earlier how Christ is English. In Spanish, it's Cristo. In Greek, it's Christos. Then in Bengali, it's Krista. In Sanskrit, an ancient language in India, Krishna. And we are making the connection between Christ and Krishna actually being the same word. And not, not his last name, but a state of consciousness. But what's really important here is the name Isha. And if you go to Iran, they don't call him Yeshua. They don't call him Jesus. They call him Isha. They call him Isha in Iran. I find that really interesting. Um, there we go. Isha Masih. Uh, so some places in India and in Iran. Um, here we go. Here's a Wikipedia thing down here. It says Isha. Isha refers to Jesus. So we have these Tibetan manuscripts referring to Jesus Christ as the name Isha being found in India near Tibet like, or in Tibet, like that whole area. Iran, they're using the name Isha. Then we go over here, the island of Jesus. This is in, this is in uh, Scotland. In Scotland, there's an island called Elin Isha, island of Jesus. So here we have Isha being found in Great Britain as well, like way off on the, uh, way off somewhere else. And then we get, this is just another thing because a lot of people say, Jesus. They're saying like, oh, it's Zeus worship. You're worshiping Zeus when you say Jesus. Jesus. And, and, and this thing, uh, I'll just read it out loud. They're saying uh, the Greek is Zeus. Is, is but I, I'm not saying that. Because I, I, my favorite name for Jesus is, uh, is Jesus. Because I'm like, I, I, man, those demons leave when I say in the name of Jesus. <laughs> But what I'm saying is like right here what it's talking about. It's talking about Yeshua. It says Yeshua means Savior. He's the Messiah. Isha means Lord. I'm like, dude, he is Jesus Christ. He's Yeshua HaMashiach. He's Isha Masi. I'm saying does not equal. I'm like, Jesus, Zeus, no. Lots of, you'll hear lots of people be, say that. They're like, oh, his name's not Jesus. It's just Zeus worship. I'm like, dude, I rebuke demons in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Like, it works. That name works. Okay, uh, Isha Masih, we have that in India and Iran, Yeshua HaMashiach, Israel and the Middle East, Jesus Christo, Jesus Christo, Latin America, Jesus Christ, the Western world. There is power in the name of Jesus. All right. And if you're ready to take, take your life to the next level, to really change, to really be filled with love, joy, peace, happiness, harmony, abundance, prosperity, just fearlessness, courageousness, bravery, the fruits of the Holy Spirit. I cannot recommend more enough. Oh, A, seek first the kingdom of God that is within you. And, and by seeking the kingdom of God, it's a purification process. When we're meditating and sitting, we're purifying. And also part of that purification is the water baptism, where you just, I say, when you realize that he is the Messiah, no, I, I'm not for it when, with, when, when we have blind belief. I want you to know. I want you to know that he is the king of kings, that he is the Lord of lords, that 
as far as I know, he is God in the flesh here on earth, incarnate to be our Messiah, to be our Savior. And when you come to that same realization, I encourage you to get into a pool of water, get into your shower, get into a river, get into the ocean, get into a lake, and baptize yourself in water. Go through the Ten Commandments, apologize to God, realize that we've been screwing up our whole life, and realize that you want to be good. You want to be good because good is godly. You want to be a sanctified saint. You want to be a devoted devotee. You want to be a disciplined disciple, a purified purist. And the water baptism is an initiation into Christianity. And when you start adding, going into your prayer closet through the stillness and the meditation, it becomes Christian mysticism. And it is, it's the way, y'all. It's the Tao. Uh, God bless all y'all. Thank you for listening to this presentation. And what is a sin? A sin simply means missing the mark. And it's the bullseye. And what is the bullseye? The bullseye is in the middle of your brain. It's the pineal gland. On the zodiac man, Taurus is shown as the head and the neck. And we have the eyeball in the middle of the brain. The outer red ring of the bullseye target is the blood barrier between our, the outside of our head and our skull. The second ring is the blood barrier between our brain and the pineal gland. And the red dot in the middle of the target is the pineal gland, which is the bullseye, which is the target. And that's where the Christian mysticism comes in, the meditation, focusing on the single lie that Jesus Christ taught us about. And Jesus said, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. And something that's been an absolute game changer in my life is the Lord Jesus Christ prayer, which comes from the Russian and Greek Orthodox, Orthodox Church, which is older than Catholicism. And the actual rosary uh, for Mother Mary was inspired by the Lord Jesus Christ prayer, which is the essentially the original rosary. And I've been including it in my life nearly daily, part of my sadhana, part of my spiritual practice. And it is an absolute game changer, y'all. And uh, what I like to say personally is I say, thank you, King Jesus Christ, for being merciful with me. And traditionally, it's Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. And if this interests you, you can start by saying it out, out loud, um, then move to a whisper. Um, what I usually do is I say it silently to myself in my head. I find that to be the most powerful I usually sit on a pillow on the ground in a meditative posture with a straight spine. I keep my hands, my legs still. I keep my eyes closed, straight spine, because that's very important so that the kundalini can travel up the spine. And every prayer, I will do one big, deep, full diaphragmic breath with my lungs. So breathing into the belly, to mid chest, to upper chest. And so say, for example, for on the inhale, I would say, thank you, King Jesus Christ. And on the exhale, for being merciful with me. And then sometimes I expand it. I'll say, thank you, King Jesus Christ, Son of God, for being merciful with me, a sinner. Amen. And yeah, just have fun with it, y'all. Rabbit hole. I think that's the last slide. Yeah. Anyways, y'all, I want to take y'all down the rabbit hole now. And I didn't make any slides on this. And this is... This is actually the most important part, part of today's talk. We can take a break now if y'all want and then come back and talk the rabbit hole part as if this hasn't been enough of a rabbit hole already. We're gonna, we're gonna really get into it though. Like, it's gonna really start now. You know, you don't really understand sometimes what a terrible burden it is to know some of the things that I know. To try to wake people up and impart this knowledge to them and find out that they just have walls built in front of it. They want to be slaves. Now I risk sounding like a conspiracy theorist, but it's no longer a theory. What I'm about to say is fact. The secret organizations of the world power elite are no longer secret. They have planned and are now leading us into a one world communist government.
politicians. Politicians are put there to give you the idea that you have freedom of choice. You don't. You have no choice. You have owners. And they own all the big media companies, so they control just about all of the news and information you get to hear. They got you by the balls. They don't want a population of citizens capable of critical thinking.